Turn in our Bibles, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. We're going to look at verse 1 through 4. Man, it's good to get back in, into the pattern, right? I, I just, I feel it, you know. I'm just happy to get back in. I want to go through the Bible. The holidays are great, you know. It's just awesome. You know, we had some great songs. We had great events. We had four big events, and they were so successful. It was just wonderful. Title of the message today, uh, Ministry Under a Microscope, or... Serving with a right heart attitude. Very important. Could we put the overhead up there of Proverbs 27, verse 3? I'm going to take a look at this thing. Let's go ahead and read this all together nice and loud. You ready? Here we go. Know well the condition of your flocks and pay attention to your herds. So because we're going to be dealing mainly with pastors, say we're not all pastors, but there's a lot of you that will teach, and then everyone is geared to serve. That's God's plan. There's a way to serve with a right heart attitude. The Bible says that you're to know your flock. I'm to know the flock. And so I heard a story about a shepherd, and of course he knew his flock. <clears throat> it starts out with a lady who happened to be blonde, and she got sick and tired of all the blonde jokes. And she said, no more. So she dyed her hair black and you know, says, forget about it. No one's going to tell me any jokes like that anymore. So she's driving through the countryside, right? And here comes a shepherd, and he's got a big flock of sheep, and there he goes, crossing the road in front of her. And she calls the shepherd over, and when he comes, she says, if I can guess the number of sheep in your flock, can I have one of them? And he's like, whoa. Nobody ever asked me anything like that before. But he said, well, she can't count. So, okay, go ahead, go for it. She looks at the herd. She looks at the shepherd and says, there's 257. He almost fell over. That's the exact number of sheep in his flock. And he couldn't believe that this woman did that. So he said, all right, lady, go ahead and pick you out a good one. And uh, so he continued to move the flock of sheep across the road. And the lady was about to now take off and continue on her journey. And then she heard a knock on her window on the passenger side. She rolled down the window and the shepherd said, uh, if I can guess the color of your hair before you dyed it black, can I have my dog back? <laughs> so, I just, so, okay. I'm going to hurry up and apologize to everybody blonde around here. So. <laughs> okay, anyway, he knows his flock, all right? That's the point. And so to know, what does that mean? It means to include observation, recognition, care, instruction, designation, even punishment. Now let me just go over those words again. It does include observation. It's not only that I know you by the way you look, your name, but to recognize what is God doing in your life to the point of where do you fit in the kingdom of God, in God's church, to care for those who are sick or maybe in the hospital or whatever situation, to give instruction through the word of God and... Um, and designate those places where needs are that we need to have filled. But it even includes punishment, and I know that many of you know that there is the whole account of a shepherd when he has a wayward lamb or a, a wayward sheep will break a leg on purpose, but then he'll carry that sheep everywhere he goes as the leg mends. And we've even seen... Uh, uh, pictures in, in the video of the shepherds of the Middle East and how the guy, the shepherd, would be on his donkey, but he would still be holding the sheep as it mends. And the idea is that the sheep will learn to stay closer to the owner, to the shepherd, and not go wandering off in dangerous areas where they'll get hurt. So today, uh, we're going to place ministry under a microscope, and Peter's going to give us three essentials to look at. And one is practicing what we preach. It's very important that we do that, and we'll see how. Also, number two, gifting matching our calling. We want to be in the right designation, the right position. And number three, the desire to please, please the Lord. When we're serving, we got to remember that we're there pleasing the Lord, not ourselves or not impressing other people. So at this point, uh, let's go ahead and stand before the Lord. I'm going to read through our text we are again in 1 Peter and chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. 
Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So there again, all the way up until when Jesus Christ, the chief shepherd, appears, there will be pastors. God ordains it for congregations of people. He likens us to sheep. We need shepherds. Uh, Let's go ahead and do this if you're able. If you're not, please don't even try. But since every knee will bow and every tongue confess, let's go ahead and take a knee if you can. And let's go before God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we're so glad that you're here today. There was a lot of prayer during worship. And Lord, you know, when your flock has needs, it's good that we have a prayer hearing God. And I know that you're going to answer. Lord, we look to you and we will not be disappointed. As we go through these verses and we dissect each point, I pray that if conviction needs to happen, that it will. That people will embrace uh, information and empowerment that will help them to grow, to progress individually. After that, Lord, have your way. But I, I pray, Lord, that you would anoint this message and that you would deal with each individual in the building and those who are with us on YouTube. In Jesus' name, amen? All right. 1 Peter chapter 5. I want you to know that at the time of the writing here, it's 30 years since the crucifixion and the ascension of Jesus Christ into heaven. And Peter has been serving the Lord these 30 or so years. It's approximately 64 AD. There's trouble in the churches. And you might begin to think, well, there's trouble in the church in general today too. And there was. There was a scattering going on in the churches throughout Asia Minor. There was also a famine in Jerusalem. There were Gentile churches that were giving financial offerings to support the brothers and the sisters who were in Jerusalem at the time. And so the church was in a time of disarray and duress. Don't forget, Nero was persecuting the church and he was, what, the king of the world at that time. And so uh, we see that there was a famine there more in terms of physical food, but for us, take a look and be reminded of Amos chapter 8, verse 11. This right here, gang, brings it home to our time right now. Behold, days are coming. Amos wrote this a long time ago, and he's talking about our day. Declares the Lord, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but rather for hearing the words of the Lord. It's not that easy to find a church that's going to really focus on teaching and feeding the word of God. That would include everything, all the really cool stuff, the exciting things, but also include the fact that there's a hell and that people are going there. And the vast majority are. The, hell, the road to hell is wide. The road to eternal life with Christ is very narrow. So many shepherds are out there, especially when we have communications the way that we have today via television, radio, etc., on the internet. And there are many shepherds that have questionable practices. Jeremiah has said some interesting things here, which um, is quite direct when you think about it. For the shepherds have become stupid. I mean, okay. They've done what? They've become stupid. And ha- besides that, this is the word of God. I want you to just be reminded. It's not just Jeremiah. This is God's word to a prophet. The shepherds, that is the shepherds of the people, not the shepherds of the sheep. They've become stupid and have not sought the Lord. Therefore, they have not prospered and all their flock is scattered. Well, that's what's happening today. And I think a lot of God's flock is scattering even if they attend some churches because you need to embrace the full counsel of God in the whole book. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 or 2 verse 3, let no one in any way deceive you for it'll not come that is uh, the antichrist will not come unless the apostasy of falling away comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed the son of destruction. So that seven year tribulation Jacob's trouble is not coming until we see a falling away. I hope that in the midst of it that we see some kind of an awakening 
maybe at the very end, but this apostasy or falling away is something that has been prophesied. On the bright side, we see in John 16, verse 1. Let's go ahead and read it all together. Ready? These things I have spoken to you so that you may be kept from stumbling. You keep from stumbling by sticking with the word of God. And so... I think it's noteworthy that Peter likens, as well as God, likens his church to a flock of sheep. There are no sports teams that take mascots that are sheep. Can you name one? If there's one out there, I don't know what it is. I know there's the Detroit Lions, but there are no Detroit sheep. Right? They don't have Detroit sheep. They don't have Detroit. There are L.A. Rams, but there are not L.A. Lambs. You don't get it. <laughs> It doesn't happen that way. Then, so you don't see that. On money, look at the money. You got buffaloes, right? You got eagles, ah! but you don't have a lamb. Nobody puts sheep out there. And in terms of the names, I thought of the Arizona Cardinals. That's a little weak, but we've watched them. Like we have this uh, gray water stream that never dries up, goes through our property. Everything comes to drink there, including everyone's cows. But uh, <laughs> there's like four Cardinals over there the other day. And they are nasty. A male cardinal will not allow another cardinal within a mile. It's, you know, they're aggressive. And so even a cardinal is more aggressive than a sheep. <laughs> anyway, someone once said that sheep are the best argument against evolution because they would have never lasted this long alone, all by themselves. And so the first section is the essential of practicing what we preach. That's our first section. If you're watching on YouTube, follow along and you might want to take notes as well as the people here. So we welcome you. And verse one, therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder. There's no arrogance in Peter. He calls himself a fellow elder. He never claims he's the Pope or the first Pope. And the witness of the sufferings of Christ. He saw Jesus suffer. He also saw Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. He saw him in his glorified state. He goes on to say, I'm also a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. And many commentators think that seeing Jesus be glorified on the Mount of Transfiguration is where he would have seen that. There are words that are being thrown around here, and, and you could bypass them, but elder is separate from shepherd or overseer. It comes from a word known as presbyteros. It's a reference to an office, not the age of a person. And he is someone who oversees what's going on in the flock of God. Uh, shepherd was noted in our four verses here. And just to say that word is interesting because it's poimeno. And that's where Bill Holdridge, who started the poimen ministry, uh, got the word shepherd. And so what there are is a group of mainly Calvary pastors that go all around the world. They're finished pastoring the churches, the flocks that they had on a regular basis. And they go all over the world wherever there's been trouble, wherever there's been a sinful failure by a pastor, or there's some kind of a tragic thing has happened. They go in kind of as a fixer upper. They're the guy in there to comfort the flock, feed the flock, and try to raise somebody up or prepare that church for someone to come in and be their permanent pastor or shepherd. Then there's the overseer, and this word should be familiar to you, episkopos. That's where we get the word episcopalian. Presbyteros is where we get the word presbyterian. And an overseer is somebody who oversees the flock in the sense of warnings or to warn the flock in what to beware. Like, don't let this false doctrine creep into your church. And so you really need a good board that oversees the flock of God. <clears throat> the overseer could be translated as a superintendent, but all three terms actually apply to the pastor as well as those on a board. But I want to say this about that. No matter what area a person serves, and God does assume that because of the grace that we've been given, somewhere along the line, there's going to be some form of service. And it could be anything. It doesn't have to be teaching children or ladies teaching ladies, the men teaching the men, or, you know, or what I do. It doesn't have to be that. It could be anything. It could be uh, a ministry to homeless people. It could 
be someone who's got a food ministry. So it's, it covers a large territory. No matter what area you feel drawn to, get this, actions speak louder. Your actions will always speak louder. If your actions are communicating something different than what you're saying, nobody's going to hear it. You who have been parents should understand that when you had children, more is caught than taught. Is that not true? More is caught by your behavior than what is taught by your mouth. Because they'll just say, well, hey, you know, you're not doing whatever you want me to do. Why should I do it? And so the office of a pastor is that of a teaching shepherd, a teaching elder. And he is the one mainly feeding the flock. My job is also to equip the saints for work of service. And, and in a big way, that, that happened in the last almost two years. As we examine Peter's heart under a microscope, so to speak, we see a lot of humility in that he called himself a fellow elder. I like that. He didn't raise himself up and say, you know, I, I'm the leader of all of you. In fact, it was Paul that was the leader of Christianity to the Gentiles, to people like us. And, and Peter and John were mainly dealing with the Jews back in Jerusalem. So uh, he identifies himself as pretty much equal. And, you know, consider Peter, though. The dude was already, what, a legend. Everybody knew who he was. He was a famous guy. Thirty years had passed since Christ ascended into heaven. There was something that Peter uh, stood against, and I want to have you put up Revelation chapter 2, verse 6. And I know you've heard it before, especially the ladies that were here on Tuesdays. The Bible says, in speaking of the church of Ephesus, right? Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So Nico refers to rule over, Laetans refers to the laity. You people. And so what does that mean? You're not to be placed under any unnecessary or forced into any unnecessary situations that you just don't want to do. Uh, there's not to be some kind of a condemning message that I would give you to push you into a ministry. You know what? If we don't have someone that would be called to just say a, a section of ministry in a church that most churches maybe have, and if we don't have that person that is willing and even able, we're going to get to that, to do that and to perform that leadership, then we just won't have that group. It's okay. Because you want somebody that's going to be called by God in these positions. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24, not that we lord it over you. See, when Paul was writing, he said, we're not here to put you under condemnation, to boss you around. We're... I'm to identify as much as possible your gifts where you might fit or not fit, because that's true too. Not that we lord it over your faith, but our workers with you for your joy. For in your faith, you are standing firm. So I'm supposed to be a helper of your joy. If you're in a ministry you hate, we either need to replace you in that or close down that ministry. So... In terms of a relationship, you cannot give out what you have not taken in. It's just that simple. You know, if you don't take in a lot from the Word of God, if you're not really involved uh, with your own personal Bible, reading and studying, reading through the Bible, um, we gave those calendars out not too long ago. If you're not involved in that, you, you, how are you going to give anything out? Uh, two weeks in a row, I gave out our presentation to you in the bulletins that we use so successfully in other nations, especially Honduras. I gave that to you. That is food. It is yours to devour. If you devour it and memorize both sides of that page, you'll be able to talk to just about anybody about the Christian faith and how they can receive Christ and receive the gift of eternal life. So in terms of relationship, you, you can only give out what you take in. Uh, if you have nothing to say when somebody comes up to you and says and asks you, well, what's the Lord showing you today? If you don't have an answer, you probably need to step back and examine what's going on in your life as far as what is the priority. 
You might be in the wrong position. So when your relationship with Jesus is real, then you're going to have something of value to share with other people. I'm going to take this opportunity since I said that word value because we're talking about not only pastors, but people serving in a church and a church congregation. On your bulletin, I hope you never get used to seeing what I write about value in that bulletin because Satan will creep quietly and slowly like guerrilla warfare, right? Okay. And if you let value go to the wayside and you don't elevate one another and you no longer value one another and you can start talking bad about one another and then the next thing I know, one will be sitting on this side of the room and one will be sitting on that side. That's the beginning of cancer, spiritual cancer. That's the beginning. For most of you, all you got to do is go back two years ago. You never want to see that again. Never again. And it'll begin if you devalue one another. So just by a word of exhortation, do not get used to seeing that without paying attention to it on your bulletin. You value God and his people through humility and respecting. That means we're going to be honest with each other and uh, we're going to love one another. So, yeah, you can't give out what you don't take in. There's a pilot and uh, this pilot was flying his plane from L.A. To, into Alaska. And so he had people on board. But his friend, who was blind and had a seeing-eye dog, was on the plane too. Well, uh, they began to have trouble, and the pilot landed in Sacramento. And there was going to be a four- to five-hour delay. And so the plane deboarded, and the people went into the airport, and it was hanging out in that section, that waiting area. And so the pilot went over to his, his friend was blind. He says, well, you want, do you, you want me to take you out? And he says, no, no, I'm just going to sleep. I'm going to take a nap. But you know what? My dog might want to go out. And so the, pet, the pilot took the dog out. But before the pilot deboarded the plane, he put on his sunglasses. <laughs> and then he walked right past all the people that just got off his plane. Some of the people actually decided that they wanted to take another flight. <laughs> How's this guy going to get us where we want to go? Right? You cannot give out what you do not take in. Don't fly God's plane with God's people in it if you don't have a daily relationship with God and his word. So goes the shepherd, so goes the flock of God. That's frightening to me. <laughs> so, so goes the shepherd, so will go the flock of God. And so just so you know what will start happening to you without you even figuring it out is your pastor is praying like he's never prayed in his whole life. So if you find yourself going into your prayer closet, spending more time with Jesus Christ, so goes the shepherd, so goes the flock. And you'll figure it out from there. All right, we got to practice what we preach or we won't be effective. Secondly, the essential of gifting accompanying the calling. Your gifting accompanies the calling that God has placed in your life. And so in verse 2, if you follow along in your Bibles, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight. So you know we're talking shepherd, overseer, to go with elder, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain. You don't serve for money. I'm just wide open. You'll correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, maybe I'm just some old fashioned old hippie dude. But when I came up, I started really being active in a church, in a congregation, at the end of the Jesus movement. It was foreign, completely foreign for anybody in my Christian experience, to get up on a stage and play their instrument in a worship team for any amount of money is completely foreign. I don't know anybody from the, that era of the 80s, the early 80s especially, that ever did, well, hey, I'm really good at what I do. I mean, Joe Stolpa, he's, you've seen him. He comes with Mike Wilson in, the, in his band, the guy that really plays lead guitar like nobody else. And when Joe comes here and plays, there was no such thing as Joe ever getting paid just because he played in this 11-piece jazz band in Cincinnati. You know, it's just, he's really good. And he could get paid. But not, you know, I, okay, so you can tell me why I'm so wrong about that or why I question it. But to me, I get it. I'm 132 years old, and I don't get it. 
I, you know what? I, I, I won't say that. I better not. I just, because somebody will misread me. I just love serving God. I have never asked for a penny to serve here. It took 10 years before they finally started giving me something, but I never, ever asked. And I wouldn't. I just, I don't know. I know who I was before Christ. And so I just think I ought to do what God tells me to do. And so that, none of that's in my notes, but I just, ugh, the attitude is. And so you don't do it for sordid gain. You, look, okay, I'm going to rat on my mom, right? Okay, she accepted the Lord, she's in heaven. But when she was lost, even my mother said, you know what? You could be married and be a Lutheran pastor, and then you could get this money, and you'd get these tax breaks. Oh. Okay, yeah, because you know Jesus. Everybody knew Jesus said, oh. So, but look, I mean, George Mueller's father wanted him to be a pastor. He wasn't a believer. George Mueller's dad wanted him to be a pastor because he thought there would be a parsonage that goes with the church building, and then the old man would retire, and he'd live in George's house. Like, really? I mean, do these people ever just imagine you're going to really stand? You're going to see Jesus. You're going to see him. That ought to put a holy fear in every one of us. I'll guarantee you, you're not going to see Jesus and say, wow, can I get your autograph? No. <laughs> you're you're going to bow down. Every knee will bow. Every tongue confess. I mean, the king of glory and all of his holiness will be the, the God who made you. Motive for serving is everything. And it, the motive is not for money. Okay, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples for the flock. So here we go. If you don't enjoy studying and teaching others, then you probably need to serve somewhere else. And there is no loss in saying, well, you know, I'd rather clean the church. We need somebody to clean the church. This is, we need somebody to pick up anything out there floating around. We need someone to clean the breathe. We need someone to make the coffee. We need someone to come in early on Sundays and set the table. We need somebody to shut this place. I could just sit here and go on. We need, we need, we need. And we do. And just, if, if, it's, if people don't join in shoulder to shoulder and play a part, then <laughs> it comes on the few. And that's no fun. <laughs> we can't do everything. Gifting will accompany your calling, and it's, it's not always teaching. Uh, there are pastors who have the gift of exhortation. They're exhorters. My son will argue with me today about anything. But no, he, if we sit in a coffee shop or we go to a restaurant, he'll argue with me back and forth, and he never just lays it out on me, you know. But he'll say, you know what, I think you have the gift of exhortation more than you are a teacher. And so I just, you know, I don't know. I used to have somebody else in my life that said, you know what, you do have the gift of teaching because once you leave the lectern and step down, you don't make any sense. <laughs> it must be God. So, uh, yeah. So, <laughs> don't touch a teaching ministry unless God has touched you for it. There are plenty of ministries. You know what? If God judges you on your faithfulness, just be faithful whatever he calls you to do. Just do that. He's got the bulletin folder over here and the sticker on the, the little Jesus books we give out to everybody. You know, I'm glad she does it. So when I go, to, I can't even go down to Phoenix. I lose more money going down to Phoenix because, you know, inflation. You know, now I'm up to three bucks. Every time I go through a corner and I pass all the homeless people, I give them the books of three bucks and it's got the Jesus thing in there. And I'm just, you know, I battled myself with it and I'm past what are they going to do with the money. If somebody asks you for your coat, then give them your cloak too, whatever that style is, you know. So somebody wants my hooded sweatshirt, I give them the t-shirt too. So you, you just do it. You know? Yeah. The purpose of any teaching ministry is in Ephesians chapter 4. And let's take a good look at this. If you're teaching, you're not a pastor, but you're, you're teaching in some other area, okay? I mean, 
I could set some of you up right now on a rotational basis to teach at You Matter Ministries, 31st Avenue and West Van Buren. For some of you, you'd have to hold your breath as you walk out of your vehicle into that crowd. You might have to hold your nose. God loves those people. And he gave some, Jesus, as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastor teachers. You know what? You, you're, if you're a pastor, you're going to teach, even if you're an exhorter. For the equipping of the saints, you might have the gift of prophecy too, and be a pastor. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. Is that not cool? There's, your perp- There's the whole thing. You're supposed to come in here and be equipped as a saint for the work of serving. The whole purpose of you being equipped to understand anything about the Bible is so that you'll serve. That's what the Bible says. It's right there. For the work of service to the building up of the body of Jesus Christ until we all attain uh, to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. We're supposed to be growing in the knowledge. And when that happens, we mature to a mature man or a mature woman to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. And as a result, we're no longer to be children tossed here and there, different waves of doctrines that come our way. So that's the purpose. If you're a teacher of any kind, you're communicating Bible studies and, and any front of any kind, you're going to have periodical times of leanness. It comes with the territory. Sooner or later, you'll see fruit, though, but you won't see it if you quit too soon. And there, again, is another encouragement to be someone who's in communion with the Lord on a regular basis. Be in the ministry in the right place God wants you to be. But even when you're in it, there will be times of leanness. Stuff just occurs, and sometimes it's completely out of your hands. And sometimes... When lean times come, God did it. You just don't know. So the idea is to be faithful. And when you are, you'll see the fruit as you equip other people who are coming, uh, listening to you. So the fruit will eventually grow and then show. It'll grow and show. But be faithful. Uh, Be serious enough to be prepared and, (laughs) and study to show that you know what you're talking about. Be prepared. Be like a Boy Scout. Be serious enough to be prepared. 2 Timothy 2.15, here we see here, study to show yourself approved unto God. Be approved unto God. If you're approved unto God, you'll be approved unto most people anyway that are serious about the Bible. A workman that doesn't need, that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of the truth, or you're accurately handling the Bible. You want to be accurate. You want to be somebody... If you're not a student, then you won't, you won't be a teacher. Just, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means you're going to do something else. You know, maybe you're an evangelist and you just go crazy evangelizing the whole community uh, when most people won't. That'd be a great blessing. Um, but you've got to be ready. You just don't want to make a habit of being ill-prepared. And so this guy told me a story about this American Indian and he goes into this church service, and the pastor was ill-prepared. So he thought he was going to make up for all of his lack of knowledge and preparation um, by being someone who cried and sobbed, and he yelled a lot. He raised his voice, and the crowd began to uh, be drawn in with all the emotion, you know, like, wow. So when the service was over, a lot of people uh, walked past the pastor on their way out. He said, wow, that was really great. Oh, it was just awesome. Man, you know, I just love that, what you were saying. So the pastor went to the American Indian guy, and he says, well, what'd you think? And he said, high wind, big thunder, no rain. No rain. It was a fake job. You had big wind, big thunder, no rain. There wasn't really any food. You thought you were going to get something, and it never showed up. And so... Hosea 4, 6, right there in the very beginning of Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I also reject you from being my priest. Heavy stuff. So, 
God's word is, is actually food. There are several verses that describe your Bible as being food for your spirit. The prophet who has a dream may relate his dream, but let him who has my word speak my word in truth. What does the straw have in common with the grain? Or I like the King James too. It says, what does the chaff have compared to the wheat? And so the covering or the shell of the wheat is the chaff, right? And so, oh, if a guy has the prophecy of something that's coming in the future, that's the chaff. It blows away. But the wheat, which is nutritious, is compared to the word of God. And that's why there shouldn't be any churches that substitute the word of God for psychology. If we could put on the next one, we see, then I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you on knowledge and understanding. Jeremiah 3.15. That's what God's looking for. And if we put on the last one here, we see in Psalm 119.105, thy word is a lamp into my feet. It's a light into my path. You know, Peter's even going to say in his second letter that this is uh, the divine power. Jesus Christ is the divine, uh, gives us everything we need pertaining to life and godliness. Jesus gives us everything that we need pertaining to life and godliness. And he gives us his word. That's either true or false. You have to decide. Is that right? Well, it's the word of God that said so. Anyway, uh, I'm going to move on down to no prayer in your life means no power. Could we put on Psalm 27, Psalm 27, and just look at that in verse 8, Psalm 27, 8. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I will seek. If you're a teacher and you don't do that, you'll be crippled. You'll be limping along because it's not any teacher in their keen mind and intelligent wit that is impressing God with anything. It's those who humbly go before God and you, you want his input, his anointing on a message. You want the truth to be coming forth for people. Just be willing. Be somebody, even who's a teacher, to be willing to, as the sign says, go in low. Sometimes it does take calling some people. I believe that we're living in times where people are so easily distracted by the things of this world and what they're going to do and what what thing of no value they're going to let consume their life. Um, I mean, you could go on and on. The phone is a great consumer of time and life and you know, all this. And it's addicting and I could go on and on about that. Ezekiel 34, verse 6. My flock wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. My flock was scattered. I believe that's happening today. My flock was scattered over the surface of the earth and there was no one to search or to seek for them. And sometimes I think, especially at a time like this, uh, it's important that we do that. I've, I've heard where pastors have said, you know, well, you know, you don't have to uh, maybe call somebody that has not shown up or somebody that's gone wayward. And well, I just, I choose to disagree. I think it's better to go after them. And uh, if they were a false convert, go after them all the more. Why not? Now, okay, you, you, however you go out, go in low. Jesus says, I'll be with you to the end of the age. Go where? Go out and evangelize. Well, I don't have that gift. It's not a gift. Right? It's not. Go in low. I will be with you to the end of the age. That's what Jesus said. All right? I told you I end up in Phoenix. And I go down these corners and I give these little booklets out. So if you could put the overhead, this is what I ran into the other day. There you go. Check that. Can you, is there any way to zoom like on the phones? No. I don't know if you can read that. But so here's the deal. I've been finding this going on in the, on, on the internet. And so like I found it. I don't want to waste a lot of time, but I found this person out of uh, Moody Bible Institute that is this very powerful evangelist. And uh, I was talking to someone in our church, a younger person, and I showed them uh, a, a person this South Korean girl. And she's right out there in the wide open evangelizing in parks and everywhere downtown in front of uh, homosexual bars. And she don't care. She goes everywhere. And, uh, 
And what I was told by a younger generation was, we know her, and she's really bad. TikTok. And now she's born again, and she's one of the greatest evangelists in the United States of America. So I pull off at a QT gas station, and I find this character here. So you know what? I used to play Columbo in the special delivery. I was Columbo in the Columbo skit. So I always got, you know, excuse me, sure, there's just one thing bothering me here. I got to go look at that. And I thought, okay, now what is that? Corner, I-17 Camelback. I believe that's a student from GCU who doesn't want to be identified as a Looney Tune, but wants to tell people about Jesus Christ and may have very well watched YouTube and seen that South Korean, but not ready to stand out in front of the crowd of what? Normal Christians, boring Christians at GCU. So this person, it is a young female, is totally disguised. I don't know if there's a gym bag anywhere on the corner or what. You go into QT, you hit the restroom, change your clothes, and then you go off to class. I don't know. But that person is disguised. And if I go back and see that person, I'm going to find out. But you know what? You think, wow, that's a real kook. At least somebody's out there. At least somebody realizes the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't know how the United States ever gets turned around without that. You know what? Politics will never do it. It's not in the White House. It's in, the, it's in God's house where the change happens. All right. So let's get off this section. Close it up with the essential desire to praise our Lord. Um, never serve for money. Mention that. The temple was cleansed twice of people that were serving God. The priests, you know, all for money. Uh, I told you that when I was in the special delivery Christian comedy ministry. We went to a mega church. We did two services and got a quarter. No lie. You go out to go out. Just go out to go out. Pick up your check at the rapture. So when people are allotted uh, to our care, uh, you have been allotted to my care. I will answer according to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17 of how I pastored this church. And I will have to tell the God who made me uh, how I did it and answer any questions that he has. So serve in any way you want to serve, any position that feels where you belong. Do it with a willing heart to please God. You please, he loves you already, okay? He lo- but pl- you want to do it in a way with a good heart, not complaining, not griping and complaining. Read Exodus and find out what happens to complainers. So... This is a quote from a pa- this is a true quote from a pastor in Whittier, California. And he said, I was talking to a guy getting ordained so that he could do a wedding. And he said, I responded, that's a dumb move. Amen. That is a dumb move. Because now you're a fake pastor. What is that? Don't serve to please people. It's God's flock. And he entrusted people to other trustworthy people. So understand that you'll never please people if you try to please them. There's that old story of an old shepherd and he's got this young boy and they they, they got a donkey with them and they're herding the flock and they got a long distance to go and they go to the first community and somebody shouts out to him, hey, you're a fool. He said, why am I a fool? Because you you and that little boy are walking, you got a donkey. That's just stupid. (laughs) Okay. So (laughs) they keep walking to the next town And uh, now the old guy is riding the donkey and somebody shouts out and says, hey, hey, you're stupid. And he says, why am I stupid? And he says, because you're making that poor little boy walk. You shouldn't do that. So he took the kid off the, or he got off the donkey, you know, put the kid. Now you get to the next town, everybody's angry. And uh, people are calling him names and saying, you're breeding laziness in that young boy. Get him off that donkey. (laughs) So, So he takes the kid off the donkey And now uh, they both go on the donkey and they arrive at the fourth community and people are shouting out, cruelty to animals, cruelty to animals, because there's two people on the donkey. So the end of the story is that the old man is carrying the donkey to the next town. It's just to say that you're never going to please all the people. So whatever, you know, if you're teaching, just be somebody who does it to please God. 
it done. Because do your work heartily as unto the Lord. He'll take care of any rewards that he has in store for you. So people are always going to question you no matter how hard you try. And if a church grows, opinions grow with it. So, and then let's just really wind up with joy. Serve joyfully, no matter what see here, that we are to serve the Lord with gladness and come before him with joyful singing. We have one more, and that's, that's the heart attitude. In the future, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, uh, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So the crown is not just for a pastor or an elder. It's, for, it's available to all of you also. So very, very important. Practice what you preach. Your example means everything, right? Okay? And then be somebody who realizes your gifting accommodates your calling. And uh, the, the, the purpose of a pastor is to equip saints. And if you're teaching a group of people in the flock here, then that's your call too. You're to be equipping those saints for the work of service. And then finally, serve the Lord out of love and, and, and joy. You know, given 30 years, I've, I've experienced all the emotions. Up and down. Hey, this is great. Hey, I quit. You know, it's just... It's just been everywhere, all over the place. I'm a human being just like you are. But I'll tell you what, when you're really in communion with God, at the end of the day, he understands who I am, he understands you, everything about you, and he keeps you right where he wants to. You know, I don't have to. You don't have to obey God. You just obey him if you want. I just don't want to. And it bugs me if I do. So I really want to stay close with him. And so... Think about those three issues in those four verses and the fact that God does want you to serve. There's nobody that God doesn't want serving somewhere. He wants everybody to be serving somewhere. He does. Contributing. We got saved. My goodness, it was free, except for Christ who paid this horrible price on a cross. You didn't pay anything. He did. And then we just put our faith in Christ and trust our spiritual well-being to him. And he gives us new life in, in him. And so it's very important to realize that the yeah. If it wasn't important to serve, then God would not say in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that your works are going to go before the Lord as though through fire. And some works that were just done for the wrong motive or selfish motives are going to be burned up. There'll be nothing left. It's like straw, hay, wooden stubble. Poof, it's just gone. Gone in a second, millisecond. But uh, those things you did with a good motive will come forth as precious gold, silver, and uh, precious stones. So there is going to be a reckoning with our works. And he says that there are some who will be saved. Get this, will be saved, but suffer loss. Saved and suffer. There will be those who are saved and suffer loss. Why? They don't really care to serve. In appreciation for the Lord, we should be willing to serve. So... Father, in Jesus' name, I want to say thank you for the encouragement to me, especially because it is really aimed right at me, uh, but it's also for the church also. And we just thank you for that, that we could glean from it, get stronger, and uh, be led by your Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Stimulate us to love and to good deeds, Lord. And uh, finally, Lord, I just want to uh, address that one more issue to this flock and to any of you who are watching uh, via the internet. So you can all look up. I just want to say this one kind of a profound thing. The guys that were doing the Jericho walk at 7.30 this morning around the property had a discussion and we were talking about the immutable God that we serve. He is unchanging. And uh, if you take a look at Hebrews 6.18, so that by two unchangeable things, that's immutable. God judged us by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. We who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope that is set before us. See, so you can trust that if you died this afternoon, you go to heaven, if Christ is your Savior. If Christ is not your Savior, well, then you need to take a look at Malachi 3.6. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. Well, God made his promises to Israel. Therefore, they're not consumed. Did they rebel? 
Sure they did. But they're not consumed because God promised. And God will never break his promises. What does that mean if you have never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? Well, this is a thought-provoking verse. If we are faithless, he is faithful. What does that mean? If I'm faithless, he's still faithful. He can't change. God is immutable. God is immutable. He will not change. Understand this. If I take the faith, because to every human being has been given the measure of faith, right? And I don't put it in Jesus Christ, well, then I am considered like the one who is faithless toward God. He has to remain faithful. Well, what does that mean? It means that he has to have that angel toss. The word is throw that soul into hell. You say, oh, I have never heard that in church. Well, then you should have left that church a long time ago. Anybody that's faithless, doesn't matter. He, God, is faithful. He won't change. He said that salvation is through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. That's very narrow thinking. Why? Because coexist has nothing to do with God. That's why. And so when we're faithless, we did not put faith in Christ. We have not confessed him. Then God has to because he's immutable, allow you to be in hell forever. Torment, suffering, pain, a lot of agony. It's bad. It's real. And if I don't tell you the truth, then I deserve to go there. So I just want to, can we bow our hearts and our heads right now? And for everybody out watching, anybody here in the room, I'd just like to pray. Father, if there's any need, any person who has any doubt, I would pray that you would bring conviction to the soul and that you would just come alongside and show people today's their day. This is their opportunity. Even your word says today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. And so, Father, if there's anybody that really doesn't know for sure that they're heaven bound, they've never really entrusted their spiritual well-being to God. They've maybe been in church. Maybe they did. Who knows what, you know. Maybe they prayed a prayer and Somehow they needed money, but they've never really received you as their Savior to be the Lord of their life. Then I pray now, Lord, that you would speak to them, to the heart, that they would do it. And if you are someone who's watching, you hear me, why don't you just tell God right now, God, I'm a sinner. And you should know that you are. God, I am a sinner. I have nothing to offer you. I deserve hell. But I'm ready to repent of sin. And if you give me the power, I will use it to turn away from my old life and entrust everything about me to your care. Please forgive me of my sins. And by faith, wash me clean. For at this time I receive Jesus Christ as my Savior, my Lord. I repent of my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit now. And give me new life. I'm dedicating my life to you. And I thank you for receiving me. As I receive your gift of eternal life by faith in Jesus. Thank you. Amen. Y'all can look up. I just like to do what I think God acknowledges that since all the angels of heaven rejoice when one sinner comes to Christ. I want you to stop and think. Did you pray that prayer this morning? And did you, did you mean it? I mean, like if you've done it before, you, you're saved, all right? You don't need to raise your hand. But if you know this is a determining factor in your life and today is the day, you prayed, you meant business with God. Today is really your turnaround day. Would you just raise your hand? Is there anybody that prayed like that? 
this morning and you prayed to receive Christ, right? If you prayed and you watched, then there's a phone number and we want you to call it. We invite you to do that. We'd love to make contact with you and, and get you a Bible and some other things. So do that, all right? Shall we stand before the Lord? Jesus never fails, Jesus never fails, heaven and earth will pass away, but Jesus never fails. The never failing God bless you, keep you, the Lord make his face to shine upon you uh, and give you peace. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace as you go his way this day. God bless you.